This video is brought to you by Bombfell, handpicked clothing for men. Save $25 off your first order by going to bombfell.com slash HTME. That's B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash H-T-M-E. Sometimes on the job, things get a little dirty, and oftentimes I have nothing to wear. And even when I attempt to make my own clothing from scratch, I fall a bit short. Normally, I hate clothing shopping. It is a real chore. It's very time consuming. Thanks to Bombfell, I was able to get this outfit really quick and easy. I didn't have to leave the house. Bombfell is a great, quick alternative to getting great fitting, quality clothing to you without having to visit the store. I got connected with a personal stylist, Michael, who emailed me a selection of clothes. I have 48 hours to kind of confer back with him, make any changes, and then they mail it to me. And now I have seven days to decide what I want to keep, what I want to send back. The more you keep, the more you save. So using Bombfell is a bit easier than trying to make your own clothing. So please check out bombfell.com slash HTME for $25 off your first order. That's B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash H-T-M-E. And now, back to our video. Earlier this year, I started a series on making weapons, starting with a Stone Age blade using napped obsidian shards. Now that I've produced my first metal, copper, next I'll be alloying it with another metal to form a bronze that I can then cast into some form of weapon. In anticipation of this, I've done a few practice runs at casting, starting first with an easier to work with metal, aluminum. However, I found it a bit difficult to master this craft. So I wanted to bring in some extra help to learn from first before I do this myself. So before I try and cast my own weapons, I thought I'd learn a little bit from an expert. So I'm here with Greg, the sword caster guy. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do? I am a traveling sword casting teacher. I started out as a middle school science teacher and I was down the hall from the ancient Civ teacher. And so she was ruling to the ancient Greeks and I thought I should teach the kids how to make Greek style weapons. I've been doing this for about four years now, and now my audience has really grown. I'm based out of Austin, Texas, but I'm starting to travel, and so I'm now I'm kind of going around the country wherever people contact me and say they have interest, I go. Before we start the casting, Greg helped give me a little context about this copper alloy and its weapons history. Copper was the first significant tool metal because you can find pure chunks of it in nature sometimes. So this is a chunk that I found in a field around uh, St. Cloud when I was a kid up in Minnesota. If somebody would have found that during the Copper Age, they would have pounded it with rocks and maybe made something like this. And this is about as big as Copper Age tools get. Like this one is about seven inches. They might have made this or like Otzi the Iceman, uh, who they discovered in the 90s, he had a copper ax with him. When you melt um, copper, if, if something else is alloyed in it, it casts really well, so you can it changes the technology where you can cast it into a form. So they went from you, having tools about this big to swords that are cast this big. This is a, uh, a chunk of copper ore that I got from an abandoned mine in Utah, and this one is a good example of the fact that um, ores can be of different metals mixed together. Yeah. Like this one has copper in it, but you can also see the rust, so this one has a lot of iron in it as well. If somebody during the Bronze Age would have found this, they would have smashed it apart and picked at all the green bits and just yeah. left all the iron behind, yeah. not knowing that it was a metal, um, because iron melts at a higher temperature. It melts at like 2,500 degrees. The technology that they discovered to, uh, to melt bronze would have melted iron as well. But I always think that it was probably because fuel has always been so precious that yeah. you wouldn't just like waste the fuel like heating it hotter and hotter. The very earliest artifacts of bronze are copper and arsenic. Like this, this is an example of a, a duckbill axe. And this was from Mesopotamia. This is a big step forward in technology because that's the first socketed axe. And so you'd uh, like put the handle through here. These holes were uh, thought to be weight saving. And so they're just kind of lightening this up a little bit because bronze was so scarce and they had to work so hard to get it. Yeah. Um, that they never wanted to make anything bigger than that absolutely needed to be for its function. An ax like this would have been used as a countermeasure to an earlier military development, which was helmets. And so this would go through a helmet. Swords were actually the secondary weapon during the Bronze Age. The primary weapon was a spear. It doesn't take too much bronze to, uh, to make this. Yeah. Um, also you can put these on long handles and stuff so you can uh, use them in a lot of different ways. But we are here to cast swords today. Sometimes when people see a Bronze Age sword, they think that's kind of a small sword. Bronze Age swords, in fact, were mostly smaller than this. We think about this as being a Greek sword, but a lot of different cultures were using swords like this. Um, a sword that went in a very different direction was this one. This is an Egyptian Kopesh. This one is uh, interesting because it's just so completely different. This is a very early sword. Like the first Kopeshes were developed around 2000 BC. So like, Middle Bronze Age. They were originally not developed by the Egyptians. The Egyptians are kind of credited with them. We think about the Egyptian Kopesh, but it didn't start being Egyptian. 
started out being Canaanite. The Hyksos, who lived in, in Mesopotamia, they were great weapons developers. They also developed war chariots. And so they attacked the Egyptians and drove them out of part of Egypt. And then the Egyptians retooled eventually, and they came up with their kopeshes and drove them back out. It's called a sickle sword. Um, I think that goes back to when archaeologists were first unearthing these. They, it had kind of a superficial resemblance to a sickle, so they might have thought maybe this is kind of a weaponized farming tool. But during the Bronze Age, most farmers were still using these. And I know you made one like this, right? Yeah. This is a harvesting sickle. Farmers were using these until the late Bronze Age, so, so maybe like 1000 BC, because bronze was just too expensive and too rare for farmers to have it. Like, it was strictly a military thing. When you think about a Bronze Age sword, most people picture kind of a leaf blade like this. So this is actually probably the most common size of, of sword. They were, they were pretty short. This one is like the, uh, the Greek Xephos. And the Greek Xephos was kind of late Bronze Age, around 700 BC, this is kind of the state-of-the-art sword. Having now a better idea of these sword's history, I chose a classic Bronze Age Greek sword for my mold, and it was time to start the casting. All right, so we're gonna use casting boxes that look like this. So they, of course, didn't have cordless drills during the Bronze Age. It must have been horrible, all of their Drills still had cords, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> so we're gonna start with this bottom part. I'm using casting sand in here. There's a mixture of sugar sand, clay, and water. If the sun hits our sand, it'll just dry it out, and if the sand is powdery, it doesn't work. And so now I'm gonna pack this in lightly, but I'm leaving it soft enough that I can press in a sword. Take this lid and I scrape it off flat. This is um, called parting powder. It's a mixture of ground minerals and it's just making a slippery layer between the two layers of sand. Great. Now take your sword and you're going to press it in. Yeah, that's good right there. And then we're gonna press it down with the lid of the box so it goes in straight. Great. So then you put one hand on it, just kind of lightly fill in those cracks by pushing along the edge of the sword and then put the frame around it and latch the latches. All right, and then just scoop in more sand. So first you're just gonna pack with the flats of your fingers, but then it's gonna be packed in really hard. So the bottom layer, we had to be careful not to pack it too tightly. This top layer is kind of the opposite. If there is a place that you don't pack, you could have a little void underneath there and it shows up in the quality of the sword that you make. There you go. Okay, and put your screws back in. And this doesn't work every time. Sand casting is kind of notoriously iffy. So I hope we're lucky today. Very nice. And we need to uh, carve a channel for the bronze to go down into. This is called cutting a sprue. And then uh, pick up the sword from the, from the point end and just kind of blow down it to make sure there's no loose grains of sand in there. And latch your latches. Okay. And that's, that's it. it, that's it. All right. So then during the Bronze Age, is this how they would basically do it? Minus the screws. That's a great question. So they didn't have screws mm -hmm. until, you know, the Industrial Revolution. And they didn't really have like big pieces of finished lumber to work with either. The Bronze Age was a long period of time, so the way they did this change, in the very beginning, they would carve a, a wooden sword very carefully. They would use uh, pieces of flint um, and just you know carve that they didn't have bronze tools to work with initially, so they were just like carving with stone. They would make a sword very carefully, and then they would pack clay around it and let it get kind of leather hard, and then pull it apart and take the wood sword out put it back together and then put more layers of clay on the outside. And then they would bake that in, uh, in hot coals and they would lift it out carefully with tongs. They would put it in a piece of log or something like that and then pour ashes around it. So the ashes are kind of supporting the clay and then pour the bronze into it. So they were pouring into a hot mold and each one of those molds would be destroyed by the process. So it was just a one-time thing. It was. Uh, you know, better than making uh, each one individually, and they did only have to make the one master sword. So they, they were making clones of that first sword over and over again through that process. Um, in the late Bronze Age, they're actually carving stone molds. So they were using soapstone and then very carefully carving out the, the details of it, putting those together, preheat the, the stone mold, pour the bronze into it, and before it's even completely cool, they'd pop it apart, take that sword out, put it back together, do another one until their stone mold breaks. But that's, that's a way of like really kind of speeding up the process okay. and like really kind of making them kind of assembly line style. So you don't need to add any kind of extra venting for excess gas to escape or anything like that? No, good questions. A lot of people will uh, make a vent. If you're watching casting on YouTube, you'll see people pouring into a horizontal mold, have the pouring hole over here with the sprue, and they have a vent hole on the other side and you stop pouring when you see the metal come up through the vent hole. But during the Bronze Age, they poured their swords vertically. Um, they didn't have a separate vent hole. They just had 
the one uh, hole that they pulled it, poured into, so it had to be big enough that you could have both things happening through the same hole. And we're good to go. There you go. And I set my watch for 20 minutes. While we waited, Greg learned that we were actually filming this on my birthday. <laughs> I wanted to make me something special. Since it's your birthday, I know a balloon that's kind of a magic trick too. You want to see that? Sure. Okay. You have to watch carefully because people are going to ask you how I did this. So I'm going to take this ball, I'm going to push it into the inside. One, two, three. And it's in there like that. And now I'm going to make a dog around it. This is going to be a pregnant dog. I need your help. I need you to blow on the tail like this. Nice. And there is your dog with a little baby inside. Thank you. You're welcome. And you can have a sword too if you want. You want a sword too? Sure. Okay. There you are. Good. First swords of the day. Yeah. <laughs> After the scrap copper we were using fully melted, we added in some tin to form the bronze. Then it's time to pour. That's exciting. Then started the long process of grinding and polishing everything. Traditionally, a grinding stone would likely have been used for this step, but we're gonna use some power tools so it can be done in just a day. Like that edge, that looks great. Like that little spot in here is terrific. It's uncertain if all of that's gonna come out or if we may still have some of those in the middle, but don't like go in after a spot. Like if you were, that was bothering you, don't like really focus on it and dig a hole there. Like the overall shape of the blade is more important than individual little spots on it. It's just part of the casting process. Pretty much every bronze sword I've ever seen has had those. Like when you look at something in a museum or whatever, you're like, oh yeah, look at that. There's one, there's one like it. It's just part of this process. That's shaping up really nice. And I really like the color of this. That's clearly not copper anymore. That's, that's yeah. bronze, that's an alloy. That's really terrific. After sanding everything nice and smooth, it's time to start working on a handle. Next, we made some rivets to hold the handle to the blade. A little bit of glue, and it's done. Thanks for showing me how to make my own sword. It's turned out really cool, I think. Next, I need to try and apply this to the copper that I made from scratch myself. And uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna make quite enough to make a full sword, but uh, you mentioned this is the, the secondary weapon and that the primary is actually a spearhead. I was thinking maybe I'd try and make one of these. Ah, uh, sweet, that's a great idea. The trick to this is you're gonna to have to make it hollow. You have to make it with a void inside it. So uh, you're gonna do some research and figure that out. So besides this one sword, we're gonna make a second one and we're gonna see how many pennies it takes to make a sword. We'll be releasing that video later, so be sure to check that out. If you're interested in making your own Bronze Age sword yourself, 
like I did with Greg. He actually travels around the country and teaches classes on how to do this. If someone is interested in making a bronze sword like this, um, they just contact me through my website at swordcastingguy.com. I come to them and I will uh, host this at their place. If like if they can find a location for me, I need shade, electricity, and bathroom access for people and find some friends who want to do it. And if you get a minimum number that I need, I will come to you. So. Um, I am happy to say I get to travel around and do that all over the country. Glad we were able to set this up. Yeah, right and, on. Uh, thanks again. Yep, you're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.